mic on. Good morning, church. Good morning to those of you who are here who have braved the freezing cold. It's cold out there, guys. Did you notice? It's cold. But it is good to see you. It is good to be here with you. Welcome if you are joining us online um, for this Super Bowl Sunday. I never in my life thought I would see the Chiefs win a Super Bowl, much less going to two in a row and, you know, when, when, I'm not going to say it. I don't want to jinx anything. But going to two is pretty incredible. Um, and that is a thing to celebrate. But even more of an important thing to celebrate is what we get together to celebrate every Sunday, right? The, the fact that Christ is alive. He was here. He was buried. He was raised from the grave from our sins for our sake, the sacrifice he paid for us. And that is a tremendous thing that we get to celebrate um, today and every time we gather together. Um, just a couple of quick reminders before we get started. Whether or not you're watching us online, if you're here in the pews, go to opcheckin.com and let us know you're here. Uh, there's a place there to leave prayer requests to let us know if you need to get into contact, if we need to get into contact with you. Uh, we want to stand by you, no matter what it is. So let us know you're here. And um, if you are in person here, there are giving boxes at the back of the auditorium that you can leave your donation in there. Um, continue to give online, support the great work that the church does here. Ash Wednesday service is a thing that we have started um, several years now. We've been doing one, and we are glad to continue that this year. It will be online, so wherever you watch the service online, whether that's Facebook or YouTube, it will be there the 17th at 7 p.m. Um, it should be a short but hopefully very meaningful service uh, for us. And that is all the announcements, correct? Wonderful. I remembered them all. All right. Will you join me in a word of prayer? God, you are great. You are awesome. Your power is unmatched. Your strength knows no bounds, Lord. You are good. Every good thing that we have is a gift from you, God. We thank you for this day, the fact that we got to wake up and take a breath and breathe in that freezing cold air, Lord. Thank you for that gift. Pray that you will be with us today as we are gathered here, whether it's in the pews or online, Lord, that you would, um, that you would open our ears and open our eyes to see the way that you are speaking and moving in this place, even now. You are awesome. You are just so awesome and good. Help us to focus on that throughout all the time. It is in your son's holy and precious name that we pray. Amen. Will you join me in singing? If you are here with us, you would like to stand, please feel free to do so. If you are at home and you'd like to stand, please feel free to do so as well. Oh, thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy praise. Streams of mercy never ceasing, Call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me ever to adore thee. May I still thy goodness prove. While the hope of endless glory fills my heart with joy and love. Here I Blood. 
together. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It is a a good good thing thing to sing sing praise to our our God. Praise Praise is beautiful. Praise Praise is fitting. God is the one who rebuilds Jerusalem, who regathers Israel's scattered exiles. He heals the brokenhearted and bandages their wounds. He counts counts the stars stars and assigns each a name. The The Lord is great. great. With with limitless limitless strength. strength. We'll never comprehend what he knows and does. God puts the fallen on their feet again. Sing Sing to God God a thanksgiving hymn. Play Play music music on on your your instruments instruments to God. God. He fills the skies with clouds, preparing rain and snow for the earth. (laughs) Then, turning the mountains green with grass, feeding both cattle and crows. He's not impressed with horsepower. The size of our muscles means little to him. Those Those who who fear God God get God's God's attention. attention. They They can can depend depend on on his strength. strength. Amen. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When darkness veils his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. His oak, his covenant, his blood support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. Amen. Please take a seat. Good morning, everyone. God bless you on this blessed day. First, I'd like to tell you a little about what I'm wearing today. Um, You need to understand, I'm not a football fan. And I really really don't like to promote sports during communion or anything like that. But this jacket that I'm wearing is a very special one. I did not buy it new. In fact, uh, 
I inherited it three years or three weeks ago when Vicky's father passed away. This is his jacket. He was a great Chiefs fan, and Vicky watched many games with him on Sunday afternoons. And when the family presented me with this jacket, I promised myself I will wear it to church on Super Bowl Sunday. So this is not me necessarily, but I'm glad to be here. And I said at the time, if Mahomes and the crew make it to Super Bowl. So all that to say, I'm wearing it today in memory of him. You know, when Jesus ordained the first communion supper with his disciples, that he, what, that's what he said, do this in memory of me. And this past week, I checked on the word memory in that sentence. It's a, it's a different word than you find anywhere else except one other verse. And uh, the word Jesus spoke is a special kind of memory word. It might be better translated, do this to remind yourselves of me which is similar, but not exactly the same. But that's what he's talking about. Obviously, when Jesus foresaw the next 20 plus centuries, and he knew there would not be anyone around who had personal memories of him. But to keep the faith alive, he gave us this reminder. And this bread and this cup remind us who Jesus is and was yesterday, today, and forever. So now I'd like you to join me uh, literally join me in a prayer. The Apostle Paul quoted Jesus as saying, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim my death until I come. So I'd like to lead a prayer um, in this way. I will make a short state, statement, and then I'm asking you guys to respond with the phrase, come Lord Jesus. I call it a Maranatha prayer. Maranatha is Amer Amer Aramaic word for come Lord. So when I say, for example, if I say uh, the world is in need of redemption, you will respond, come Lord Jesus. So you, you, you may bow your head and pray as we do this, and let's see if this, this helps us draw closer to him. Our God and Father, we come to you asking for the Lord's return because there's so much sorrow in the world. Because there's so much injustice. Because the world is in need of redemption. Come, Lord Jesus. Because you are the hope of a new world. Because you are the ultimate victor. Because you are the one we desire. Because you are the one we are waiting for because you are the beginning and the end, because you are the son of righteousness, because you are the bright and morning star, because you are the same yesterday, today, and forever, because in your name we eat this bread, because in your name we drink this cup, because we proclaim your death until you return. Come, Lord Jesus, now. Amen. Thank you. God bless each of you as you remind yourself of Jesus with this sacred ceremony. To Jesus I surrender all to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him in His presence day. Yeah.
Thank you all for being here so much. Um, it was two weeks ago tonight that Max came home from um, youth group and you said you wanted to be baptized and your mom and I will never forget that night. You were, um, it was obvious that you were very excited and, and uh, ready for this moment. You agree? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was no doubt about it. Um, like Chris said, these are your brothers and sisters in Christ out here, and uh, they're going to walk with you in this new journey through the highs and the lows and, and everything in between. And there's countless others that aren't here that are your brothers and sisters in Christ that are going to walk with you. Um, and and through, through, through everything, good and bad, all right? And of course, next to the body of Christ. Um, so before we give the confession again and the baptism, um, I'm going to take a page out of a book from my dear friend, and uh, we're going to require a little more audience participation. Um, and I need you guys to be enthusiastic about this, and, and it's pretty simple. Um, and it symbolizes what Chris said, a, a new beginning or a rebirth. So right before Max... Uh, goes under the water, I would like for you guys to yell out and wave and say, bye Max. And then when we come up, I want you to say, hi Max. Can we do that for me, for us? Okay. So you've confessed already, right Max? Mm -hmm. In the name of the Father and the Son, in the Holy Spirit, I baptize you, Max. That was pretty awesome. That was uh, Wednesday night. Um, that was Max Haney. If you don't know who that is, Max is the son of Burton and Shannon Haney. And uh, he's got two sisters, Maeve and Noah. Uh, they usually um, come to the instrumental service. They've been uh, missional partners here for uh, quite a while. And 
It was a gathering of the youth group and um, some close family friends. I was able to be there, and uh, there were some other family members, grandparents and stuff, and it was a really cool experience. And, you know, I... Uh, I don't know what the uh, angels in heaven think about the Super Bowl, but I know they were celebrating Max um, on Wednesday. Um, was that cheesy? Is that, is that? But it was good, so okay. Um, it's a perfect way, though, to actually move right into our text. Um, celebrating Max's baptism on Wednesday night uh, just leads us right into where we're going. Um, We're in Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 through 19. This is our text today. Colossians 2, verses 6 through 19. It says, As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, continue to live your lives in Him, rooted and built up in Him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the universe, and not according to Christ. For in Him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have come to fullness in Him, who is the head of every ruler and authority. In Him also you were circumcised with a spiritual circumcision, By putting off the body of the flesh in the circumcision of Christ, when you were buried with Him in baptism, you were also raised with Him through faith in the power of God, who raised Him from the dead. And when you were dead in trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive together with Him. When He forgave us all our trespasses, erasing the record that stood against us with its legal demands, He set this aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and the authorities, and He made a public example of them, triumphing over them in it. Therefore, do not let anyone condemn you in matters of food and drink or observing festivals or new moons or Sabbaths. These are only a shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to to Christ. Do not let anyone disqualify you, insisting on self-abasement and worship of angels, dwelling on visions puffed up without um, cause by a human way of thinking, and not holding fast to the head, from whom the whole body, nourished and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows with a growth that is from God. It's the word of the Lord to us today. Um, I was baptized the summer of 1992 at Camp Wiregrass. That's me. Um, Yeah, say aw. No, thank you. Everybody at home, say aw. Um, I was baptized the summer of 1992, Camp Wiregrass. Camp Wiregrass was a regional Christian summer camp. Um, People from all over the southeast region, Georgia and Alabama and Florida and uh, Tennessee and other areas came to this camp. Um, once I was uh, old enough, uh, there were I would be there like four or five different weeks because I got to an age where I could go there some weeks as a camper and then other weeks as a counselor. Um, and so I got to a point where you could ask my mom, I lived at Camp Wiregrass um, some summers once I got to a certain age. And I remember this night really well. I remember that uh, one of my counselors had been talking to me about baptism, and one day he just asked, he says, why haven't you done this yet? Um, And I didn't have a good answer. And so we we talked and talked, and I finally one day said, you know, I'm I'm ready to say yes, I'm ready to do this, I'm ready to be baptized. Um, We called my mom and dad to let them know, and, and they wanted to be a part of it, and so we decided to schedule it for later that night to give my parents enough time to drive, because it was... uh, hour and a half, two hour drive um, to the camp from where I lived. And so we went with our normal activities for the day, knowing that later that night would be my baptism. And so um, one of the things that we did was we had a, a chapel service every evening, an evening devotional. And um, the speaker that night had set up on stage, we had a chapel that was like out in the woods, and the speaker had set up on the stage of that chapel a big, large wooden cross about the size of this one. 
And I remember him talking about um, our sins and Jesus dying on the cross and uh, what that meant for our sins. And I don't remember exactly uh, what text he was talking about. It's very possible he was talking about this text. Um, I just don't remember. But I just remember him talking about sins and the cross and, and Jesus dying on the cross for our sins. And at the end of his talk, he gave all of us campers uh, little sheets of paper and a uh, pen, and he asked us all, uh, write down a sin that you're really, really wrestling with. Or write down a, a number of sins you feel like you're really wrestling with. Or, or maybe it's not a sin you're really wrestling with. Maybe it's a sin that, that you had committed uh, earlier and you just don't feel like you're forgiven and you're, you're wrestling with the guilt and write that sin down. But what, just write down a sin or a number of sins that are really kind of bothering you, that's really uh, messing with you right now. And so all of us campers, about 200 of us middle school campers, we're all writing down sins on our sheet of paper and then we line up in front of this cross, and he gives us each a hammer and a nail. And we nail our little sheets of paper with the sin up on the cross. And then once we're all done with that, then he says, I want some of the campers to volunteer to pick up the cross. And so me and some others, we picked up the cross, and we put it on our shoulders. And all the campers and all the counselors got together, and in one big line, we followed the speaker out into the middle of this big field. And when we got to the middle of this big field, there was a big hole that had been dug in the ground. And he said, I want us to bury the cross and bury the sins. And so we threw the cross into the ground, and we were all had different shovels that were already out there, and we took the dirt, and we're throwing it on top of our sins. And that night, um, uh, about 200 middle school kids nailed their sins to a cross and buried them, kind of signifying uh, the release of them, the forgiveness of them, the cleansing of it. And then it was probably 30 minutes to an hour later, I was doing this. I was standing in the shallow end of our swimming pool at camp, surrounded by all of our campers and my mom and dad, and my little brother, and uh, I was waiting to be baptized into Christ. And, and as I was preparing today's sermon, those memories came flooding back to me because I really feel like in a lot of ways, um, I experienced that night what Paul's talking about in this text today. Um, I feel like I was able to somehow live out uh, what Paul is talking about in our text. So, so let's dig into this text. Um, Scott McKnight, uh, a New Testament scholar I really uh, read a lot and um, listen to a lot, he says that he really believes that verses 6 through 7, those two verses, are probably like the summary statement of the entire letter to the Colossians. Verses 6 through 7 is the summary statement of the entire letter. They have received Christ Jesus as Lord. Now, uh, the New Revised Standard, which is what I'm reading from, says simply that they received Christ Jesus the Lord. And it kind of gives the impression of like they accepted Jesus into their hearts, kind of a modern day language. That's not what Paul is saying. Paul is not saying they just received him, like accepted him in their hearts. No, the language is confessional. They have received him as the Lord. They have publicly declared him to be the Lord. Does that make sense? It's confessional language that he's talking about. They have received him. They have declared him. They have pledged their allegiance to him as the Lord. And he says that now that they have done this, now that they have pledged this this, uh, their allegiance to him, now that they have publicly confessed him to be the Lord, he says that he wants them to continue to live their lives in him. Now, we've already talked about this a little bit earlier because there's another place in Colossians where he talks about living their lives in him. And the language is more literally, it's walk. Walk in him. Or walk like him. Do the Jesus walk. And so confession... I think first thing we need to see is confession must always be followed by practice. Confession must always be followed by a walk. Because confession means very little if there's no walk to back it up. Confession means very little if there's no walk to back it up. And he says he wants them to continue, now that they have confessed him to be the Lord, he wants them to continue to walk in him. And he says that this walk... It must be rooted in Jesus, and it must be built up in Jesus, and it must be established in Jesus. And then he says it must be expressed in an overflow of thanksgiving. 
Now these words that he gives us here, these words rooted up, rooted into, built up, established in, these are going to be really important words for Paul because he says that some are going to try to take you captive through philosophy and through empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the universe, and not according to Christ. Now, no one really knows what the philosophy is he's referring to. Um, No one really knows exactly what the human tradition is that Paul is referring to here. I want to say that it's not just philosophy in general. He's not just opposed to philosophy, and he's not opposed to human tradition even. It's a philosophy and a human tradition that is not according to Christ, right? There's a difference there. It's not that he's just warning them against philosophy and against human tradition. He's not saying tradition is bad, but it's philosophy and a human tradition that is not according to Christ. And we'll never know if that is really happening in our lives if we are not rooted in and built up in and established in Jesus, Right? If we're not rooted in Jesus, if we're not built up in Jesus, if we're not established in Jesus, then we won't know if someone's trying to take us captive with these empty deceits, these, these empty philosophies and human traditions. Now, Paul's going to get a little bit more specific. Even though we don't know exactly what the philosophy is or the human traditions, he's going to get a little bit more specific about the different human traditions that can get in the way of the simplicity of knowing Jesus. And what he t- describes sounds like legalism. Um, legalism uh, is a form of religion that says that our standing or our salvation is dependent upon how well we follow the rules, right? Our standing in Christ and our salvation is dependent upon the do's and the don'ts. Paul goes on to say, um, he'll talk about being condemned or being judged based on matters of food and drink or observing festivals and new moons. And then in in a text that we're actually going to dig into next week, I'll give you a little preview now, he goes on to talk about submitting to regulations like do not handle and do not taste and do not touch. And he's going to go on to say in that text next week, he says, those things look like they have an appearance of wisdom to them. They look religious. They they look like they would be pious things to be concerned about. They look like they would be good church things to be concerned about. But he says they're not. They're not. They are empty philosophies, he says. They're human traditions that are mere shadows of the reality. So, if they're mere shadows of the reality, if they're mere shadows of what really matters, then what is it that really matters? Well, we already know this because it's been everywhere in this letter so far, and it will continue to be everywhere in this letter. What really matters is Jesus. Jesus is what really matters. Remember, in Colossians, Paul's answer is always Jesus. It's always Jesus. And this is most evident probably in our text today because he talks about being in Jesus and walking in Jesus, continuing to live our lives in Jesus, continuing to be rooted in Jesus and established in Jesus, built up in Jesus. He's going to go on to say that the whole fullness of deity dwells in bodily form, and you have come to fullness in Him, right? If you are in Christ, you lack nothing. If you are in Christ, you lack nothing. Those other things will do nothing for you. Those other things will not fill you. They will not bring you to fullness. As a matter of fact, if you place too much faith in those other things, it will actually take away from the fullness you find in Christ. It could actually make you empty. You can place so much faith in the do's and the don'ts that you find yourself being pulled away from the supremacy of Jesus. You find yourself being pulled away from the fullness of who Jesus is and who you are in Jesus. And I want you to notice the the contrasting words here, right? He talks about an empty deceit and a fullness that's in Jesus, right? Empty deceit, empty philosophies, empty human traditions, fullness in Jesus. Fullness in Jesus. 
And so if you are in Christ, you lack nothing. It's not Jesus and. It's Jesus. I think a lot of times we get really focused on the and. And we major in the and. But it's not Jesus and, it's Jesus. And if you are in Jesus, you lack nothing. So the question then becomes, okay, well then, how do we find ourselves in Jesus? How do we make sure that we're in Jesus? Well, for the Jews, the Jews, the way that you entered into the Jewish community, the way that you entered into the Jewish covenant was through the act of circumcision, right? A little less traumatic for babies, uh, a little more traumatic for adults that wanted to enter into that life. But that was how you made sure you were in right? That was the mark for being in. And it's possible that whatever this Colossian heresy is, right? We say we don't fully know, but whatever this Colossian heresy is, it's possible it's got some heavy Jewish elements to it. And why do I say that? Well, because Paul ends up saying, in him, in Jesus, also you were circumcised. Now, why would Paul find it important to say that unless there were some people around there that were talking about circumcision and trying to get them to be circumcised, to try to uh, teach the necessity of circumcision. And Paul basically says, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. You have been circumcised. Now, he's going to say, it was a spiritual circumcision. That's the NRSV, which is what I use. Uh, Another translation more accurately puts it, it was a circumcision not performed by human hands. That's really what the Greek says there. Like the physical Jewish circumcision, they did have a circumcision, and and this circumcision was a stripping away of the old body. It was a stripping away of the old self. Now, when did this happen? Well, it happened whenever they experienced the circumcision of Christ. Or some other translations say it happens whenever they experience the circumcision performed by Christ. Well, what in the world is he talking about? Well, he's talking about what Max did. He's talking about baptism. He says, in this circumcision of Christ, when you were buried with him in baptism, right? Just because the circumcision was spiritual doesn't mean there wasn't something physical that took place. There was a physical thing that happened. This spiritual event has a very physical marker that they can look back on. This very spiritual event has a very physical marker that they can remember, that they can look back on. Paul connects the spiritual circumcision with a physical baptism. When they were baptized, a very physical thing that they can look back going, yeah, I remember when I did that. I remember that picture from 1992. I remember doing that. And Paul says, in that moment, if you look back at this thing that you did, this experience that you had, this baptism when you were buried and raised, if you look back on that, that's when you were circumcised. That's whenever you experienced that entry right, right? Circumcision was an entry right into the Jewish way of life, and Paul seems to be saying that baptism is an entry right into the Jesus way of life. Circumcision, entry right into the Jewish way of life. Baptism, an entry right into the Jewish, to the Jesus way of life. And so Paul, like he does a lot of times, Paul never sticks with the same metaphor for very long. He never sticks with the same imagery for very long. And so um, with baptism, he's always mixing his metaphors. He's always mixing his imagery. And so in, in one sense, baptism is a circumcision right? In one sense, baptism is their entry right into the kingdom. No one can exclude them or call them outsiders because they have the mark of the Jesus life that has been placed on them. But baptism is more than just the circumcision. He now moves into another set of imagery, another metaphor, and he goes, baptism is also this death, burial, and resurrection moment that you experience. 
He says you were buried with him, buried with Jesus in baptism. You were also raised with Jesus through the faith and the power of God who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive together with him, right? Baptism is not only a circumcision, but it's also a death, burial, and resurrection moment. We are buried in the waters of baptism, right? When we, when we go down the waters, it's, a, it's a signifying a death to our old selves. And then through our faith in the power of Jesus to raise Jesus from the dead, God then raises us from the dead as we come up out of the waters and we come up a new life, right? Death, burial, resurrection. This fits with Romans 6. Right? Paul talks about this in Romans 6. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Right? We're going down. Therefore, we've been buried. Right? We're, we're, we're buried in the waters of baptism. So that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. Right? Scripture has a lot of different ways to talk about baptism. I don't know if you really picked up on this. I, I've gotten to where when, when I talk to people about baptism, um, I like to walk them through all the different ways because there's so much different, there, there's a lot of different metaphors and imagery, and sometimes we get hung up on just one, and, and that's the one we kind of pound on. But Scripture has a lot of different ways to talk about baptism. It's a circumcision. It's a death, burial, and resurrection moment. It's a washing or a cleansing. It's a reclothing it's a, an adoption moment. It is a, a pledge or a commitment moment. Like there's all these different ways that Paul and a lot of the other New Testament writers talk about baptism. Suffice it to say that there is a lot going on in one's baptism. That God is doing a lot of really cool things in one's baptism. God is working powerfully in and through one's baptism. That's what Max experienced on Wednesday. He may not have known it. None of us may fully know it in the moment, but in that moment, God's doing a lot of powerful things, and I experienced that in 1992, and I didn't fully know it. I still don't know the full uh, impact of what, that, what happened that night in my own life because God works in so many powerful ways in that moment. And so baptism is this entry right into the Jesus way of life, but it's also a death, burial, and resurrection moment for us where the old life, we get to say goodbye to Max, and then we get to say hello to Max as he comes up a new creation. And so now Paul's going to move very quickly from their baptismal experience to now talking about the work of God at the cross. You can't ever talk about baptism without talking about the cross because those things go hand in hand. And so he talks about their baptismal experience, but then he wants to point them to the cross and the work of God at the cross. And he says, God made you alive together with him when he forgave us all our trespasses, erasing the record that stood against us with its legal demands. He set this aside, nailing it to the cross. Now, I grew up being taught, and if you grew up in the Church of Christ, you probably grew up being taught this too. I grew up being taught that what this is saying is that Jesus nailed the Old Testament to the cross. That's not what Paul is saying. Paul is not saying he nailed the Old Testament. I've heard people say, oh, that was in the Old Testament. That was nailed to the cross. I don't have to listen to that. That is not what Paul is saying here. Paul is not talking about nailing the Old Testament to the cross. I really think the New Living Translation really captures the essence of what Paul is getting at here when he says, he canceled the record of charges against us, and he took it away by nailing it to the cross. What was it he nailed to the cross? Well, Paul uses a word here that is a word that really means something like an IOU. There's something that we owed God. In other words, we accumulated a debt. It was a sin debt. Sin always has to be paid for. And at the cross, humanity's IOU, our sin debt, was nailed to the cross. It was paid for. The debt that we owe, not the Old Testament, the debt that we owed under the Old Testament was paid for. Right? Our IOU was paid for. Jesus paid a debt, right? We, I think we sing a song like that sometimes. Jesus paid a debt that he did not owe, right? He didn't nail the Old Testament. He nailed our debt to the cross. 
And whatever legal demands were being required of us, Jesus paid it. Jesus paid the legal demands that were being imposed upon us. Now, scholars are really torn about this legal demands language in Paul's letter here. Um, Could he be referring to the old law? Maybe. Uh, Could he be referring to any sort of legalism that imposes something upon us? That could also be the case. Remember the context of our text. He's already talked about human traditions, right? And he's talked about being judged about these different things. And, um, and, and he's going to talk about next week, we looked at this already, how he's going to say the regulations do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. I tend to lean toward believing that what Paul is referring to here is a legalism of any kind. Not just an Old Testament kind of legalism. But a legalism of any kind, any sort of approach that says um, you will never be right with God until you do A, B, C, D, and you do them right and perfect. I think Paul says Jesus took care of those legal demands. Anything that legalism promises to fulfill, Jesus did all that at the cross. I'm going to say that again. Anything that legalism promises to fulfill, Jesus took care of that at the cross. We have been set free. Remember what he said earlier? Don't let anyone take you captive, he says. Captive to philosophies and human traditions that take you away from Jesus. Captive to uh, a set of rules and regulations. Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. Jesus has set us free from those things, from any legalistic approach to God, and we accepted that gift at our baptism. We accepted that gift at our spiritual circumcision. And so then Paul goes on and says, therefore, therefore, because you have confessed Jesus as the Lord, because you've made this public confession, and now you've been buried in the waters of baptism, you've been raised up out of that, a new creation, therefore, because of all of this, Paul says, do not let anyone condemn you. Don't let anyone condemn you based on a bunch of do's and don'ts. Don't let anyone condemn you based on a set of correct doctrines or human tradition because we find our ultimate fullness in Christ and Christ alone. He goes on to say, don't let anyone disqualify you. Don't let anyone tell you that you don't belong, because Christ is the substance, he says. Jesus is all you need. A lot of scholars feel like verses 6 through 19 really follow an ancient baptismal uh, kind of liturgy, um, an early pattern for maybe a a baptismal service or ritual. It starts with receiving Christ Jesus as Lord, right? A public confession of who Jesus is in our lives. It starts with this public declaration that Jesus is the Messiah, that Jesus is the Lord. And then based on that that, that public confession, that public declaration, it's followed with a, a burial in the baptismal waters and a resurrection out of those waters, a new creation. And Paul tells the Colossians, remember that moment in your life, right? He points backwards for them, and he says, remember that moment in your life. Remember when you went through all of that, and here's basically what he says. Here's like a summation, Gilbert's summation of verses 6 through 19. Basically, Paul's saying, don't let anyone tell you you don't belong. Don't let anyone tell you that there's more to do. Don't let anyone condemn you or disqualify you because you don't follow their rules and their traditions. Everything that needed to be done and everything that you will ever need to know can be found in your baptismal experience when you participated in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. So Paul says, continue to live your lives in Him. Continue to walk the Jesus walk. And so if you're here this morning and, and you, you can look back and remember your baptism, Paul's talking to you, and he's saying, here's what happened. 
at your baptism. Here's what took place whenever you entered the waters of baptism. Here's what happened when you came up out of the waters. Here's what happened in that moment. Everything that you ever needed to know and everything that ever needed to be done was done in that moment. Jesus fulfilled it. Don't let anyone disqualify you. Don't let anyone uh, condemn you. Know that you belong. And maybe there's someone here who's never had that experience. Maybe there's someone at home who's never had that experience, never been baptized, never been immersed in the waters. We want to be a part of that, right? As a church, we want to be a part of that. We want to, we want to walk alongside you. And we have a, a baptistry, and it's been broke, but we're, we're, we rigged it up, and it works now. Um, and, and we want to desperately uh, be a part of that with you, just as we were with Max the other night. Um, we want to do that with you. And so, um, if there's anything we can do, if, if maybe, it's, uh, maybe it's that, maybe you want to talk about baptism or be baptized, or maybe you've got some prayer concerns, some things that you, you need to have uh, prayed over, um, whether that be in here and, and you want to share that or you're at home, let us know in the comments or email uh, one of our shepherds or one of our ministers, and um, we will uh, definitely um, walk alongside you. So um, anything that we can do, let us know as we stand, as we sing.
thank you just doesn't seem sufficient for that. Thank you just doesn't seem sufficient for bringing us into your family, for giving us that spiritual circumcision that we get to, to claim you. We get to claim you, Father. Thank you seems, oh, just like, just so inefficient, insufficient, Lord. But we offer it anyway. Thank you for that sacrifice that you gave so willingly for me, for my team, for all of the people that gather in your name, Lord. Thank you for that. Help us to walk in that, in that power, in that purpose, in that light of being your beloved. Set our feet on that path, Lord. Thank you for being our hope. And in your son's name we pray. Amen. We have one more song to sing together before we leave. Um, and then Gilbert will leave us with a benediction. But this was our Easter song a few years ago, and it just felt like the perfect fit for this morning. Um, so this is Living Hope. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living hope, who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The King of kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah, praise the one who sets me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave 
grave has no claim on me. Jesus, yours is the victory. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. God, you are my living hope. Church, may the waters of God's grace surround you and uphold you. May your baptism strengthen you for the work ahead. And may the spirit that descended upon Jesus at his baptism fall upon your shoulders as you continue to seek to do God's will. And for those of you that never had that experience, the invitation is always open. May you be blessed this week.